Hello, or should I say, Dobre uh, Ding. Pick up a little bit of Czech alum here. Um, first of all, it's an honor to be here to celebrate Guido Calabresi, who uh, actually taught me torts and uh, tort law. I want to thank uh, Joseph and Elaine and Giovanni for organizing us uh, in this great event. Uh, I'm uh, an intellectual historian, and I want to place Guido's work in kind of broad intellectual relief in relationship to the development of both law and economics, or what I refer to as law and neoclassical economics, as well as American legal theory uh, more generally. Um, I'm going to start off with some introduction in terms of my background and how I kind of come at this. Then the second part of my discussion is going to sit around what I refer to as the politics science divide in the construction of American legal theory. And given the audience, I'm going to give some kind of background with regard to American legal theory so we're all on the same page. Then I'm going to discuss kind of broad cross currents, particularly post-70s into the 80s and 90s in the American Legal Academy and Guido's kind of relationship to those broad, broad cross-currents. And then finally I'll end with his response post-cost with respect to those currents and kind of where we're at uh, today. And we know where we're at today because Guido has so thoughtfully described it to us. In 1986, as a, and Guido wrote me a lovely letter years back, uh, describing me as a timid, somewhat timid, first year law student, even though I would berate him constantly about questions in relationship to economic analysis of law. I remember distinctly that first day of law school uh, purchasing my text for torts. And the text was Shulman, James, and Gray, co-authored with the great Fleming James, Guido's teacher. And then next to the text was a stack of blue books, the cost of accidents. I said, well, I might as well buy both. So that was the moment of my introduction to Guido in terms of the theory and the cost of accidents. Little did I know, and now as an intellectual historian I can appreciate this, that it was actually, those two books actually kind of crystallized a kind of cross-section or intersection in terms of American legal theory. The intersection between legal realism and law and neoclassical economics. So fast forward some two decades or so later. As an intellectual historian, I embarked upon a project interviewing famous legal intellectuals and regrettably was not able to interview uh, Guido for the project. So now I want to take this moment right, to think about Guido in this broad relief in terms of the construction of American legal theory. So now the politics, science, divide as a organizing thought with respect to American legal theory. The kind of pull in terms of conceptualizing American law and doing American legal theory kind of revolves around whether law and legal theory is about science, this objective, apolitical, frequently axiomatic, sometimes empirical, enterprise versus a conception of law and legal theory as being political, as being about normative values. And if you're a crit, as we describe in the United States, the kind of naked raw politics of power. It's that divide that really marks the kind of formative moment and kind of original divide in American legal theory between legal formalism 
and legal realism. So legal formalism, which kind of rose through 18th and 19th century America, handed down through uh, England, had as a construction of law and conceived of law as a principally deductivist enterprise based on certain first principles devoid of quote-unquote normative values because the principles came from upon high. One principle, a kind of bedrock principle, being the notion of freedom of contract. And from that notion of freedom of contract, an ideological tilt against government intervention in private markets. This formalist view of the world held sway largely into the beginning of the 20th century. When we have the rise of legal realism, again, towards the beginning of the 20th century, moving on. And the legal realists, and again, we can count Fleming James as one of the leading lights of legal realism took the approach of law as being contextual, contextualizing law. But also the legal realists had a profound interest in, and this is the humanist perspective with regard to Guido, the actual lives of individuals. And in the context of tort law and accident law, that led to a focus on issues related to social dislocation. How does this play out in the tort realm? I'm going to focus on an area of tort in the United States that we refer to as product liability law. That's to say, what are the rules with respect to liability in situations in which a consumer or someone who uses a product is injured by that product is there a claim? What's the nature of the claim against the manufacturer? Now, product liability law, in terms of the formalist kind of construction or conceptualization of this problem, really depended upon contract. And there was a notion that survived into the 20th century of privity of contract. And this is the way privity of contract would operate. So the standard kind of business model is that we have a manufacturer, then you have a dealer who the manufacturer sells to, and then the dealer sells to the consumer. Then tort law being tort law, something bad happens, and there's an accident. And the question for courts was whether or not the consumer had a claim against the manufacturer. And the way courts dealt with this under the privity notion was to say, well, of course not, because the manufacturer has no relationship, no contractual relationship to the consumer. The consumer had a relationship contractual with the dealer, the dealer with the manufacturer, but not the manufacturer to the consumer. That was privity of contract formalism, and action. The privity notion disappeared at the beginning of the 20th century. And the most famous case in this regard is a case called Buick v. McPherson, which was authored by the great common law judge, Benjamin Cardozo, who in many ways is a kind of precursor to legal realism, often associated with sociological jurisprudence. And what Cardozo said was that the reality and the context of the situation right, is that, of course, the manufacturer anticipated that the ultimate user would be the consumer as opposed to, obviously, the dealer. That's the whole business model. Therefore, given the risk associated 
with, in the case of Buick, Buick McPherson, automobiles, liability should flow. And at that time, what that meant was that the consumer would prove fault under a negligence regime, or it happened to prove fault under a negligence regime. Now, that was 1916. Now, fast forward to 1944, and a famous case called Escola. Jesse Traynor wrote perhaps one of the most influential common law concurrences in American law. Escola involved a Coke bottle, and it exploded and bad things happened, as they always do in torts, right, Guido? And again, the question wasn't privy of contract, because that had been settled. The question was whether or not liability in this context would be, would be determined based on fault, having to prove negligence, or whether we'd move to a strict liability regime. And Jesse Traynor, when you read that opinion, effectively you took the legal realist position. Considering the social dislocation, the context of manufacturing, the consumer's relationship to the manufacturer, and in particular the issue of social dislocation as a result of all the hazards related to manufactured goods. That's the legal realist moment and the move from negligence and fault to strict liability so that consumers would not have to prove some element of fault. Now enter 1960, the law and neoclassical economics moment. So at the very time, because it took some decades for trainers' concurrence to make its way through American law and get distilled, in particular in Restatement Second, 402A, so strict product liability law became effectively the law of the land with the underpinning of this legal realist policy. And then in 1960, with the advent of law in neoclassical economics, there's a paradigm shift. So it calls into question, in terms of strict product liability, its very underpinning because there's a historical clash between neoclassical economics, institutional economics, et cetera. What are the implications in terms of product liability law with respect to the neoclassical ascent? It takes us back to contracts. Costa's insight was that if transactions costs are not prohibitive, then there's no reason for the law to intervene. You do not need a regulatory state. That's to say, well, in the Coast Theorem in a simple articulation, if someone is polluting, Pigou would have said, oh, well, you tax or penalize the polluter. Well, Coast said, well, no. Again, if transactions costs are not prohibitive, you can contract, as long as you have legal entitlements, contract around those rights and reach an efficient result. Now, the question as to whether, and Kosa's uh, hypothetical was you know, a rancher and a farmer, the question whether there are distributive effects, and you think there's something about farmers versus ranchers, well, we're not interested in that in neoclassical economics, because neoclassical economics has, as its very underpinning, distribution agnosticism. We don't care as between farmers and ranchers. We only care and are concerned with efficiency. So this has 
profound implications for product liability law because it might take us back to contract or at least call into question seriously the notion of strict product liability law. Now enter Guido. And, you know, we can do all kind of counterfactual and think about what was in Guido's mind. But I would imagine in thinking of this legal realist heritage, but also being trained as an economist, a neoclassical economist, and I think obviously understanding the profound implications of the Coase theorem. The question is, well, how do you reformulate those ideals, those legal realist ideals in an era of neoclassical economics? And that's the brilliance of cost of access. Because what Guido did was to say that the economic issue is not only efficiency and cost-benefit analysis, it's also loss spreading. The concept of loss spreading is an economic way of distilling all of those concerns that the legal realists had with regard to social dislocation. But Guido did something even greater. And it always puzzled me as a first year law student. He introduced this notion of justice. And again, myself having been trained as an economist, undergraduate, I thought it a bit bizarre in a book dedicated to the economic analysis of law that there would be this notion of justice and that he said that justice actually act as a veto constraint to notions of economic efficiency and distribution. So I was left puzzling. There was an immediate response to Guido in a book review of Cost of Accidents. Richard Posner lauded Guido for his contribution for that paradigm shift. And he actually cited to Thomas Kuhn, so the notion of a paradigm shift. But also criticized Guido for a while dethroning the legal realist, as he should, still holding on to that legal realist conception of social dislocation and a concept of law spreading. Hence the initial divide within law and neoclassical economics. Fast forward, 1980. The idea of theorizing about law, moving from doctrine and kind of generalized discussions of policy to high theory, really begins with law and neoclassical economics. But then there was a proliferation of different theoretical constructs. But a lot of it was centered around a response to the legal economists. And I want to focus on two responses that I think were pivotal. The critical legal studies response and the liberal rights theory response. A critical moment here is a symposium issue in 1980 published by the Hofstra Law Review. In it, all of these theorists from the different genres 
were considering critiquing Richard Posner's idea of wealth maximization. The Rice Theory response to wealth maximization, as articulated by Ronald Dworkin in a famous article, again published in 1980 in the journal Legal Studies, entitled Is Wealth a Value, was to attack both Guido and Dick Posner. Posner for holding up wealth as the goal in law, and Guido for arguing for trade-offs between wealth and justice. Dworkin taking the view, as a high philosopher would, that rights trump all. In that same symposium, the critical legal studies adherents, and I'm going to focus on two, Ed Baker and Mort Horowitz, Baker, and critical legal studies is a real left of center, kind of theoretical, and grouping right, in American academia. Baker made the argument, a very influential argument, that you can't think about wealth without thinking and considering the initial distribution of wealth and starting points. Therefore, a discussion of wealth without a discussion of distribution is nonsensical. And to argue that you could talk about wealth without distribution, and this is the critic, crit spin, is a political moment and gesture itself and reflects the politics of the ruling class. Mort Horowitz made a similar argument against law in neoclassical economics as well as against Guido. Now, Guido's response. In that 1980 symposium, he wrote a letter, the title of his article was a letter to Dworkin. And a salutation, and now I actually get it, Guido, given Laura's biography, began, Dear Ronnie. I never, I never could understand that. I thought it was so, so colloquial. But they were childhood friends, so now it makes perfect sense. And what Guido said in that piece was he agreed with Baker about the starting points critique but also asserted that he, Guido, was not making trade-offs with regard to efficiency and justice. Go back and read Cost of Accidents and Hackney scratching his head. Well, what about justice? And justice is actually a veto constraint, paramount to all. But, and this kind of gets to, or is related to Guido's talk today, Legal economists, Guido argued in that 1980s piece, should not focus on grand theories with, with, with regard to justice, Ronnie, but should make modest attempts with regard to a conceptions of justice. And when we think about the development of Guido's thought, kind of post-1980s, I think it's in large part making those modest attempts and pointing the way for others. He followed that 1980 piece with a piece in 1982 entitled The New Economic Analysis of Law, Scholarship, Sophistry, or Self-Indulgence. Very provocative. And what he did was to recognize the critiques of law and economics from both the left, CLS, as well as from rights theorists. But also to draw, again, a clear distinction between his brand of law and economics and what he referred to as, quote, Professor Posner and his followers, 
close quote, who, given their distribution agnosticism, calibrates the level to charge of sophistry. But then he had a message to his followers, the Calabresian line, to us. That's to say, to the extent that we did not do the hard work of thinking about justice and placing economic analysis against the backdrop of an analysis of revealed distributional preferences of society, again, we can think to the talk today, or articulating some defensible notions of justice. His followers were engaging in self-indulgence. In 1984, Guido wrote an article entitled First Party, Third Party, and Product Liability Systems. Again, reiterating the starting points critique of the Posnerian School of Law and Economics. And then critiquing the CLS group, in particular Duncan Kennedy, who he argued conflated justice with ideology. Their conception was actually too political, not analytical. And what he argued for, again, was what he refers to as middle theorizing. That would constitute scholarship, not sophistry, and not self-indulgence. That's the path that Guido has taken. And we see this in his recent text, the book, Ideals, Beliefs, Attitudes, and the Law, published in 1985, in which what Guido does is to take political values at the forefront and discuss their relationship to tort law and tort law policy and theory and doctrine. He begins the book, and don't we remember this as tort law students at Yale Law School under Guido, with a hypothetical of the evil deity. And with the evil deity, he'll begin the torts class with this hypothetical, okay class, the deity comes down and gives us the following proposition. The deity will cure whatever ill, bring some treasure to you, wonderful bounty. But as a trade-off, 1,000 of you will die horrible deaths on a yearly basis. But it'll be random, don't worry. What do you think, class? And we all are in horror. Oh, of course, Guido, we'd never make that trade off. And then he would look at us in that way that only Guido can, with that twinkle in his eye. What about automobiles? I teach tours and I do the exact same thing, Guido. Because what Guido wants us to focus on is the subterfuge, how values are hidden. And the problem with the Posnerian School of Law and Economics is that it subsumes those values and doesn't recognize the fact that you can't think of law, we can't think of legal theory without coming face to face with these issues of values. Now, in the balance of the book, 
the tort kind of piece of the book. Calabresi talks about the concept of reasonableness, which is a cornerstone for negligence doctrine. That's the benchmark for whether or not you act in a faulty way. The quote unquote reasonable person standard, that's the common law standard. And it's supposed to be a neutral standard, and it's a standard that law and economic scholars, particular Richard Posner, lies as being analogous to cost-benefit analysis. And, and here, this is really a fascinating, I think, intellectual moment because what Calabresi does in thinking about reasonableness and this standard in tort is to focus on cultural bias and reasonableness. Because the reasonable person standard began as the reasonable man standard. So, exclusion of women. The reasonable person standard, as originally articulated, did not include black folks in America because of racial exclusion. The issue of race. Again, it was another head-scratching moment for me. When I picked up ideals, beliefs, and attitudes, I said, well, I know Guido's going to talk about you know, tragic choices, et cetera. And he starts to talk about race in America. And what he says about race, and again, this is interesting, given another intellectual movement in the United States, critical race theory, he says his underlying proposition is essentially that race is a persistent phenomenon in America. So we can't understand the behavior of black folks in America, and particularly in relationship to accident rates, varying accident rates in terms of blacks as a group versus non-blacks as a group. So we can't understand that without understanding the kind of history, legacy, and persistence of racial bias. And he also says, just to let you know, reader, that he thinks race is a social construct. Very interesting. Right? Now, the upshot of his analysis, so I have to be brief and cut short, is that while economic efficiency might call for a disparity in terms of treatment with regard to accidents based on race and particular insurance premiums based on race. Again, it's interesting as discussion of insurance today. Of course, we wouldn't want that. That meaning higher race of accidents by black folks, in particular poor black folks, what well, is due to a history of legacy of racism, et cetera, a regime of higher insurance rates on those very same folks would be discriminatory and go against our value of equal treatment and non-discrimination. But the solution is actually quite different or difficult. And he ultimately argues for a social insurance regime, which, well, Guido Van Guido, right? Social insurance, we love that. But the problem is that the very same society that would discriminate on the basis of race would be hesitant to have a social insurance regime as a response to racial discrimination. Now, the point of the analysis for Guido, and he talks about it being hypothetical and not necessarily agreeing with any of the assumptions, but to point out that frequently what's, what happens in economic analysis or the way we think about the world is that we, instead, instead of realism about the world, 
be it legal realism or racial realism, we engage in, quote, subterfuge and wishful thinking, close quote. Guido's middle theorizing is all about uncloaking that subterfuge, having us, whether we be legal economists or legal theorists of any stripe, face the world as it is. And that, Guido, I think is your legacy. And it's a legacy we'd be well served to pursue, if only with a fraction of the vigor, intellect, and humanity that you've done throughout the course of your brilliant life. Thank you. Thank you very much. So just, uh, <clears throat> sorry again, we have some time for a few questions. So if there are questions or remarks, yes, Guido. If I may, in this very rich discussion, I want to put a few things in a, diff in a slightly different context or historical context. One is, when I went to Yale Law School, it was a very odd moment because the last great flowerings of the legal realist movement were coming into contact, debate, discussion, and friendship with the last great flowers of the Harvard legal process movement. That is, Gilmore, Bitker, James were there, but Bickel and Wellington and people like that, Lipson, were coming from Harvard to Yale. And it was in that context that the uh, formalist tradition and the uh, legal realist tradition were clashing. And that was part of my growing up. And that growing up led, I think, or maybe it was me, to a notion that what one wants to do all the time in law, but it was also why I went to law from economics, is to be rigorous. Hence, the attempt at law and economics, the attempt at theory, at all of these things, but that law was inevitably normative. So that you had both, and the interaction of the two was an essential part of what was going on. So that in any number of ways, we are the scholar analyst, looker at theory to help us understand what is going on, and then we always find that the world is somewhat more complicated. And the more complication means that whatever theory we have doesn't quite do it. Now here a story. The notion of justice as a veto point was not meant in cost of accidents to be all of justice. There are other parts of a cost of accidents which talks about justice, as the philosopher would, as being the overarching everything, of which efficiency is certainly a fundamental part. It is unjust to waste, you know? So that justice is what we're all about, all about, not a trade-off with particular parts, and efficiency and other things we analyze as part. The other justice was, as a veto point, was meant to be the statement that whatever theory we have doesn't cover all of the world. That our theory is always going to be lacking and must be tested by what is going on in the real world. An anecdote with respect to Ronnie, as I still call him, Dworkin, is that when I wrote that, Ronnie was at Yale because I'd brought him there, and we talked about it, and I said, will anyone confuse other justice, which is simply a statement that there are some things that our theory hasn't dealt with, with justice as a whole? 
And Ronnie at the time said, no, 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 it's perfectly clear. Then in 1980, when he wrote his article, he criticized it by saying Guido uses justice as a partial trade-off rather than the whole thing. He had forgotten, and he reread the book, and reading the book that time, that's what he did. I could be criticizing him, except that being a believer in products liability, I put that product out and it had a defect that led it to be misunderstood in that way, and that's my problem, not his. But it remains true that what I was saying there is what I've been saying now, which is that you analyze, you must analyze, you must criticize, you must use all the theories that you can with respect to efficiency, you must try to make uh, things like uh, spreading into theoretical constructs, you must try to make distribution into theoretical constructs as best you can. I want it to be as much done by economists because I like the theorizing of economists better than those of other theories, but if you can't do it through economics, you'd better do it in some other way rather than just reacting in something, and you will still never get it complete because the world will always have some things that you haven't dealt with. So you go back and try to make the theory more uh, precise. If your field of theory doesn't cover it, some other field of theory is going to come in. So I try to expand the field of theory that I know best in the hope that it will deal with it, but something else is also going to come in. And that's the way it is always going to be in the real world. That is why, in the end of your paper, you talk about, in the written paper, about Dick Posner becoming a pragmatist and abandoning his theory as a judge and becoming a pragmatist. He has done that. Uh, his latest book review, Attacking Amar, uh, which is in some ways quite valid, but he then attacks all theory and acts as a pragmatist. That won't do. Dick Posner has become a crit of the right, but he's still a crit. He's still acting like somebody who is then allowed simply to say what his emotions are, uh, at least in his way of speaking, and what he actually does as a judge is much better. But in his way of speaking, he criticizes all theory that way. That won't do. We have to, if we are going to use reason to understand what ought to be, to analyze in terms of theory. And we ought to know that when we're done with that, the world will ask us for more. And we've got to do both. It's not enough to abandon the fact that we haven't gotten it all and say, well, then I can do anything I please. But it is not enough to assume that the theory can handle the whole thing. The beauty of law is that it requires both. As against a social science that can do just one part, or a politics that can do just one part, or some so-called social sciences that just waffle and don't do either. But that's what I think, and that's what your article catches. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think we are a bit late, but we were rewarded by very excellent presentations. Uh, I think that the, thank you again for to all the speakers for the, this, the presentations. There is a coffee break, I think. So, thank you all, and uh, it's uh, the, there is a short break before the next sessions. <laughs>